tonight on our special Chicago show. I'm fighting against my own displacement. Fighting gentrification, how an influx of wealthy residents in Logan Square is impacting locals. I love that we're having the conversations. I think the reason why we're having the conversations. And bookstores battling the ban. Take a look inside one Andersonville store working to highlight underrepresented stories. And later, Mystery Mermaid. We share the story of an artist and his work on the shores of Lake Michigan. Those stories and more tonight on the Northwestern News Report's Chicago Show. It's your Chicago news right, right now. now. Good evening and welcome to NNN's special Chicago show. I'm Gabrielle Coriati. And I'm Andrew Rowan. Tonight we bring you stories from across the Windy City. There's a lot to cover from the north side, south side, lakeshore, and to the west. But we begin tonight with a tragic story close to the NU community. Students are raising funds to support a Northwestern undergraduate student recovering from multiple gunshot wounds sustained last Monday in Rogers Park. McCormick's second year Anita is currently hospitalized her roommates say she was not the intended target of the attack. Anita is currently in stable condition awaiting a second surgery according to a GoFundMe page raising funds to support her operations. The campaign has currently raised over $62,000. You can support the GoFundMe by scanning the QR code on your screen now. Turning now to Fulton Market, an increase in crime is pushing this retail-focused neighborhood to step up security. A group of business owners want to hire P4 Security Solutions for an estimated $800,000 per year. Business owners say the move will increase safety and keep people shopping in the neighborhood, but past private security patrols have drawn controversy for sidestepping Chicago's police department. While Chicago developers focus on bringing retail shoppers and wealthy tenants in, they're met with opposition from locals. NNN's Melina Halkia spoke to Latino residents in Logan Square and government officials about the impacts of gentrification and local plans to fight it. Norma Rio Sierra has lived in Logan Square her whole life. She says every time property taxes go up, she's at risk of losing her home. I'm fighting against my own displacement. As more wealthy white residents move into newly built luxury homes, black and brown families in Logan Square are displaced. According to the Census Bureau, between 2011 and 2021, the Latino population in Logan Square fell by nearly 28 percent, while the white population increased by almost 24 percent. Christian Diaz is the director of housing at Palenque, a neighborhood association fighting for housing justice in Logan Square. Families like mine now I have to make really difficult choices. Am I gonna pay my mortgage? Am I gonna lose my building? Am I gonna pay the rent? But effects of gentrification on the Latino population go beyond displacement. So our schools really suffer because there's a lack of enrollment. And just like the neighborhood, the character of the neighborhood is gone. Former Mayor Lori Lightfoot piloted an ordinance in 2021 that charges developers a minimum $15,000 fee for tearing down buildings along the 606 trail, which includes parts of Logan Square. We've seen in the areas where the policy does exist that demolitions have gone down dramatically, almost to zero. But advocates at Palenque say the ordinance is temporary and does not cover all of Logan Square. At Palenque's 61st annual Congress last week, newly elected Mayor Brandon Johnson says his administration is committed to addressing these inequalities. <laughs> Mayor Johnson is hoping to expand existing projects like the 606 ordinance citywide to reduce the conversion of multifamily units into luxury single-family homes. 26th Ward Alderperson Jesse Fuentes echoes this commitment. Uh, we're also going to continue to build affordable rental opportunities and density. Diaz says residents hope the new administration will recognize the impact of gentrification on Latino families and fight to end it. We believe that homes are for families for children, for stability. In Logan Square, Melina Halkia, Northwestern News Network. Thanks, Melina, for that report. Evanston became the first city in the country to commit to reparations for its residents in 2019, but Chicago was not that far behind. The city approved a reparations resolution in 2020. However, activists say they are unhappy with the progress. And as Julia Richardson spoke to members of a commission hoping to make the resolution a reality. Because you can't just have any reparations plan. It's got to be a robust reparations plan. That's what the Conrad Worrell Community Reparations Commission hopes to introduce to Chicago. 
and they want the community's help. We want to see the robustness coming from the people because numbers speak when it comes to political processes. Reparations United establishing the nonprofit commission in 2020 after the city's previous administration turned down the idea of a separate commission funded by the city, forming its own subcommittee instead. Leaders say they feel Chicago has not prioritized the issue. Some cities who just passed legislation, you know, two, three months ago, or even farther ahead in Chicago. During Chicago's mayoral election, Howard says both candidates committed to supporting reparations. Now, the commission will send a letter to Mayor Brandon Johnson's office with a 100-day plan. It's time for all of us to come together to the table and let the legislators in this city and this state know that we mean business. NNN reached out to Johnson's administration but did not receive a response to our request for comment. Chicago residents giving their input on the plan. There's still the tragedies and atrocities still happening to us today. So that's why it was important for me to be here to make sure that whatever is being rolled out, that they are going in the right direction. I want to make sure that we're being intentional and also that intersectionality is at the heart of it. And despite acknowledging that this process may be difficult, they say they are hopeful. When our people come together so like this, this is a beautiful thing. And Julia Richardson joins us now in the studio here on The Chicago Show. So Julia, what does the reparations plan actually entail? Yeah, so leaders have identified four points in their plan. One is to establish the community-led commission that the previous administration blocked. The second is establishing an office dedicated to addressing historical inequalities. They also hope that the city's slavery, slavery disclosure ordinance is enforced for businesses, and they want to start a reparative basic income program to address urban violence for young people. And so what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? Yeah, so leaders are now looking for people to be on a selection committee for a commission of people to work alongside the city's reparations subcommittee, and they want people from all over the city to apply. Thank you, Julia, for following that story for us. Coming up, Shining with Pride, a glimpse into Pride Month festivities happening within Chicago communities. And a tasty tour. We take you on a unique experience that lets you take a bite out of the city. You do not want to miss it. We'll be right back. My narrative since I've been locked up and kind of made my transition has been like redemption, accountability. When I come into the classroom environment, every individual that sits amongst me takes education seriously. This school year, book bans across the country reaching a record high according to the American Library Association. Most of these bans focus on stories highlighting LGBTQ identities or racism. Here in Illinois, the state legislature sent a bill to Governor J.B. Pritzker last week saying that in order to be eligible for state grants, library systems must adopt a standard that indicates materials will not be removed because of partisan or doct doct doctrinal disapproval. Illinois would be the first state to enact that kind of legislation, some in the city of Chicago going beyond allowing these conversations and using them as an opportunity to spotlight representation. I spoke to one local store about their newest chapter in representation. Stability. Pride. Lynn Mooney is the co-owner of Women and Children First, a self-defined feminist bookstore and Andersonville staple for over 30 years. Continuing to evolve um, and updating our vision of feminism, 
uh, making it more intersectional. For Mooney, the goal has always been to shine a light on underrepresented voices. But now, over four times as many books faced bans last year as in 2019, according to the American Library Association. Um, I, I love that we're having the conversations. I hate the reason why we're having the conversations. She's launching a banned books group, featuring titles that have faced controversy for decades and those newer to the list. I almost wish I could launch a banned book book group in Texas or Florida. It's not where I live. That's not my community. Um, but I felt strongly that I wanted to do what I could here where I am. At Women and Children First, they prioritize diverse literature for all ages. I think the conversation should be intergenerational. Mooney says books should act as both a mirror and a window, where kids can see their lives reflected and learn about those different from themselves. Having books that um, embody the diversity that we are um, can be a child's first encounter with positive self-esteem messaging. Their team bringing these stories into new settings. I'm today putting together an order for a gay straight alliance at a, a local elementary school. And the store values keep customers coming back. Reading the words that people write is freedom. The newest chapter of a decades-long story in representation. And Gabby, there's been a lot of conversations lately about the difference between challenging books and banning books. What's the difference there? Yes, that's something that Mooney wanted to emphasize in our interview. So what she says is challenging means one person could be taking issue with the book, you know, one parent in one school, and then it gets pulled from the shelf, and that's part of the issue. You know, if books are going to be banned, which, you know, she believes they shouldn't be, it needs to be more of a process and not some action that one person takes that gets a book pulled off a shelf. Thanks, Gabrielle, for following that important story for us. This Thursday marks the start of Pride Month, and it ends Kanjal Bastola takes a look at how Boys Town resident Boys Town businesses are getting ready. Chicago's North Alstead neighborhood, commonly known as Boys Town, is a predominantly LGBTQ plus neighborhood in Chicago, and the community's businesses are preparing for Pride Month celebration. The importance of celebrating Pride, the LGBTQ plus community has always had a long-standing history of celebrating and activism that kind of go hand in hand. That we're fighting for our rights at the same time that we're having a fabulous parade and showing every color of the rainbow. Out of the Closet Thrift Store celebrates Pride year round, but now they're preparing to participate in the annual Pride Parade on June 17th and 18th. Just celebrating because it's what Pride's all about, but also just trying to get people to be like, hey, like here's who we are, here's what we do. Pride Fest will take place right here on this street, which is also home to Legacy Walk allowing people to view and honor LGBTQ plus monuments. It's like the month to be like to be out and like be able to to express who you really are. Joaquin Hinojosa, owner of a salon in Boys Town, reflecting on the past struggles of the LGBTQ plus community and the importance of honoring that legacy. Like now everything's more open, but before it was like you couldn't even talk about it or like say anything. Celebrating Pride in Boys Town, Kunzo Bastola, Northwestern News Network. Thanks, Kanjal. Chicago is gearing up for Pride events all month long. Including this year's annual outdoor music festival, Pride in the Park. It will take place on June 23rd and 24th at Grant Park. The lineup features stars such as Zara Larson and Suidi. The festival will also showcase LGBTQ plus performers, artists, vendors, and more. If you're still looking for things to do after catching Pride in the Park, you may also want to stick around for one unique tour. NNN's Michaela Denald shows us this sprinkle of fun in downtown. Ta-da, whoa! Whoa, hubba, hubba! This is Jackson Hercules. Tour guide for Underground Donut Tours has shared his love of Chicago donuts for five years. Who has the best donuts? Those are the people we chose. We were lucky enough that there was a lot of donut shops in Chicago. After its founding in 2015 and success in Chicago, the tour spread across other major cities. Hercules was there from the beginning. We had, you know, I mean, groups of three, four, five people. Um, and now, I mean, five years later, the company is in, I mean, I want to say 18 different cities. I can't even keep track anymore. The Underground Donut Tour went to four donut stops within two miles to share a little bit about Chicago donut history. Oh my goodness, wow. Visitors get a taste of the city at the donut vault with their honey bun, fire cakes with a horchata creme brulee donut, 
stands with their red velvet, and do right donuts with their buttermilk old fashioned. The menu kind of decides itself, you know, based on what the best things are. And some attendees say the taste tests are the icing on top. It was like the perfect little trip for birthday. Um, some of my work friends were all nurses, let loose, eat some donuts. <laughs> Hercules' goal, sprinkling a little heart. It's really nice when people are able to come into Chicago as tourists and see that this is a beautiful, vibrant city. In River North, Michaela Denault, Northwestern News Network. Thanks, Michaela. I definitely want a donut now. To Same. go on a tour yourself, <laughs> check out Chicago's Underground Donut Tours on their website at undergrounddonuttour.com. Coming up, a look at some green greens inside a sustainable farmer's market bringing communities together. And will the sun stay to make final setting just a little bit brighter? I'll let you know with the final forecast of the school year after the break. My narrative since I've been locked up and kind of made my transition has been like redemption, accountability. When I come into the classroom environment, every individual that sits amongst me takes education seriously. Welcome back. Chicago is home to over two dozen farmers markets. NNN's Lena Peterson digs into sustainability at Green City Market. For environment conscious Chicagoans, this is so much more than your average farmer's market. I think local food and produce is a good thing, and I think just the support that it gives kind of like the, the whole local community and local economy is, is great. Lincoln Park's Green City Market is Chicago's first sustainable market with vendors promoting locally grown and environmentally friendly products to strengthen food access. Typical farming techniques are in the end going nowhere. Uh, they're even bringing us down as a planet and as people. So, so having a market that specifically supports us, that, that's really important. Jerry Boone, owner of Froggy Meadow Farm, intentionally owns a small 10 acre farm and implements sustainable growing techniques from Japan. So we're not just taking money and handing products, we're teaching people how to use it, how we grew it, uh, how, to, how to store it, like anything they want to know. And in the meanwhile, we're creating a personal connection that makes them come back. The market serving as a great way to bring people together for a sustainable cause. Get people thinking about it too, and just kind of, um, especially now the summer is coming up and the weather is nicer, it kind of gets people to explore newer things that maybe they're not as used to bringing sustainability to life in the heart of the city. And Lena joins us in the studio now. So Lena, what, what a cool place. What makes this market different from all other markets? Thanks, Andrew. So this is Chicago's only entirely sustainable farmer's market, meaning that the vendors and farmers who come to this market have grown their produce in an environmentally friendly way. So the goal is to work to promote sustainability and teach customers about this mission while also bringing the community together. Super cool. If people want to check it out, Green City Market is open every Saturday in Lincoln Park from now until November. You likely know the Chicago River for its scenic boat tours and river walk downtown, but the 156-mile body of water also supports a wide variety of wildlife. 
volunteers collecting dozens of bags of trash in a spring cleanup earlier this month in parks along the river. In Canal Origins Park near Pilsen, they collected over 30 bags of trash. Environmental groups like the Friends of the Chicago River say raising awareness about preserving the river habitat remains a challenge. Their goal to maintain the river and its green spaces throughout the city, keeping them hab habitable for both animals and humans. If it's a healthier environment for the fish, it's a healthier environment for the mammals and for the birds, and we reap those benefits in ways that I don't think we always totally realize. Volunteers say that being mindful of litter, especially small plastics left behind, can help make a difference. For more information on how to keep the Chicago River clean, visit chicagoriver.org. It's time now for a look at the weather with NNN's Ananya Chug. What's the forecast look like, Ananya? Thanks, Gabrielle. Folks, I am so excited to be back with y'all to look at this week's weather, especially this week because finally it seems like we're headed into summer after the ups and downs of the last month. Remember when we had that week of playing spike ball on the beach? Well, that's about to be a sight that's coming back. Tomorrow we're going to see the high come to about 81 degrees. I better see y'all baby bunnies frolicking and whatnot tomorrow. Thursday, Friday are all in the 80s and it looks like that's so. So break out your Shein swimsuits, ladies. I know you ordered those. Look alive and wear your sunscreen to the beach. Saturday and Sunday, looks like it might dip down a little, but who cares? Three days of beach weather is a blessing the week right before finals. One day I wanna showcase is Friday. Now the high of 80 degrees looks like it'll occur between three and 4 p.m. As we know, that's prime beach time. So as soon as you get out of your class for the day, you better run and grab a good spot to set your towel down. And y'all are gonna have to beat me first. Let me tell you for the week. It's the last week of freshman year, it's others' last week at Northwestern entirely. With weather this good, use it well. Thanks for joining me in this update. And back to you at the desk. Thanks, Ananya. I know I'm definitely excited for this weather, especially knowing that the weekend's weather will hopefully be good um, because I'm going to the Taylor Swift concert on Sunday. I know we're going to touch on that a little bit more in the show, but I'm so excited for the nice weather, especially on that day. Yeah, I know. It looks like it's going to be beautiful. I hope you have a good concert. Yeah, it's perfect for weather for Soldier, Soldier Field. Coming up, a mermaid mystery. Meet the artist behind the beachfront sculpture with a deep connection to his family. And in our next half hour, a look inside the, struggling commuter, the struggles in Chicago's Chinatown. My narrative since I've been locked up and kind of made my transition has been like redemption, accountability. When I come into the classroom environment, every individual that sits amongst me takes education seriously. A beach, a mermaid, and a 24-year-old mystery. NNN's Ellie Skelly dives deep to find out about the mermaid at Oakwood Beach. A mermaid sits on the eastern edge of Oakwood Beach in Burnham Park. Carved out of native granite, her place of origin was once a mystery. We were already used to doing work without permission. Roman Villarreal is one of the four guerrilla artists behind the sculpture. Built in 1989, the group wanted to create art without politics. Not everything has to be political or social. The artists stayed anonymous for 11 years, with locals sharing theories as to where they thought the mermaid came from. They thought it came from downtown, and that was a good kicker. It wasn't until Nancy Moffitt, a Sun-Times reporter, wrote about this sculpture that the mystery began to unfold. Nobody knew who it was. That means it's a good story. Causing Villarreal's daughter, the model of the mermaid, 
to come forward and claim her father's work. Out on the newspaper that, hey, they're looking for the artist who did the mermaid, and they think it came from downtown. And so we had to tell them, no, Roman did it. Now, Roman Villarreal is the sole surviving sculptor. He still looks after their mermaid, hoping to protect its legacy and their story. I always wanted to leave uh, more of a identity. The mermaid on her own adventure these past 24 years. Once submerged underwater, hit by a truck, and illegally moved on the beach. I got a call from somebody says, hey, uh, we just seen your mermaid going down Lakeshore Drive. And I go, what? Should I Since sing Since the it? mermaid, Villarreal has continued creating public art. And we, we haven't moved for the simple reason that we really believe in this being a, a, a good neighborhood. We have NNN's Ellie Skelly here to tell us a little more about the statue. So Ellie, you mentioned Villarreal is still creating art. Where, where can we see some of that? Well, he has a statue dedicated actually to his family in Steelworkers Park. He comes from a family of steelworkers, and he's really all about creating a legacy on the southeast side. And so it's really important for him to bring that representation there. I think it's so cool how the whole community sort of got into, like, what is this mystery? And it took a reporter to unravel it. Yes, it was so cool, and it was crazy when I was finding out about it. It was, she works at the Evanston Roundtable, lives in Evanston, so it was really cool. Super yeah. cool. I know for me that definitely motivated me to maybe want to go down there and see the statue for myself. So coming up, we've got another half hour of Chicago news, including a look at Argyle Street's future and the community members working to preserve its Vietnamese culture. And are they ready for it? How the city of Chicago is preparing for Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. It's just three days away and Gabrielle is counting down. My narrative since I've been locked up and kind of made my transition has been like redemption, accountability. When I come into the classroom environment, every individual that sits amongst me takes education seriously. Welcome back. Argyle Street, a popular destination in Uptown known for its Vietnamese and Southeast Asian culture, is changing as many business owners near retirement age. As the future of the area is undecided, groups and individuals are trying to maintain its culture and character. NNN Sadie Frankel explored the future of Argyle Street. Argyle Street in Uptown has been a predominantly Vietnamese area since the 1980s and is home to many Vietnamese restaurants, shops, and other businesses. Argyle Street specifically um, uh, received a wave of Southeast Asian immigrants during after the fall of Saigon. Immigrants from Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries found community on Argyle Street and started businesses to bring the culture of their countries to Chicago. If you're an immigrant, then you're gonna be able to end up like finding your group there. But despite its popularity, the future of Argyle Street is in question. We've heard from a lot of our Argyle business owners that their sons and daughters went to college and um, they're not really interested in running a restaurant. With this uncertainty over who will take over legacy businesses, 
Groups such as Uptown United and the Uptown Chamber of Commerce are trying to find ways to maintain Argyle Street unique Vietnamese culture. Their business um, is important and is a legacy and it means more to an entire community than it maybe does just to their um, personal life or their family. Whitel says there is no definitive answer, but the community is doing what it can to make sure that the culture is not lost. There needs to be a stronger concerted effort of succession planning for these type of legacy businesses because I you know legacy businesses are important in terms of like preserving that heritage and that culture of that area. Maintaining the culture of Argyle in Uptown, Sadie Frankel, Northwestern News Network. And Sadie joins us now. Sadie, can you tell us a little bit more about what residents' specific concerns are for the future? Yeah, so many business owners in Argyle are actually nearing retirement age because they immigrated after the fall of Saigon, which was quite a while ago. Um, and a lot of their children and family members are not interested in taking over their family business, which means that there's questions of what businesses, what's going to happen to these businesses after they retire. Thank you so much, Sadie, for bringing us that story. Andrew? Thanks, Gabby. Now, Argyle Street isn't the only cultural area facing uncertainty in Chicago and beyond. Chinatowns across the U.S. are diminishing at an increasing rate. That's according to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. But what about Chicago's very own? NNN's Angela Zhang takes us to the historic site's inner streets and the answers they may hold. A train ride down south will take you to Chicago's Chinatown on Cermak, a historic neighborhood of sights, sounds, and stories. But culture may face a threat. The wave of, you know, gentrification or the wave of rising costs, I think, starts in like the loop and kind of like brushes southward and westward. Rising costs and luxury development pushing residents out of communities. David Wu, the executive director of church-based immigrant center Poitak, says this isn't new. The original Chinatown was very close to downtown and it got pushed uh, about two and a half miles away from downtown over a hundred years ago. With just one street remaining, national parallels emerge. The National Trust for Historic Preservation, listing Chinatowns in Philadelphia and Seattle among the most endangered historic places. Both of those uh, Chinatowns in international districts um, face uh, tremendous gentrification pressures. While Chicago's Chinatown is nearly the only one growing in population, it's also not immune from change. The 78, a 62-acre high-end development project in progress. Residents voicing concern about the project taking up space in Chinatown. Sometimes fears that like they're gonna take away things that were beautiful. Viewpoints held by locals of many ethnic neighborhoods. The community has to be organized and advocate for the need to protect uh, the character of the community. Sustaining culture while facing modernization. Angela Zhang, Northwestern News Network. Thank you, Angela. As Asian American and Pacific Islander Month comes to a close, NNN's Lance Wilhelm takes a look at a restaurant that has served as a staple of Chicago's Korean American community for decades. Yosai. Opening in 1995 in Rogers Park is the oldest K-pop bar in Chicago, according to manager Jason Cho. We might have been maybe the first in this area or where we sell this stuff. Specializing in Korean street and comfort food, Yosai provides a taste of home for Korean Chicagoans. And people liked it. It had a homey vibe to it. Over the years, the restaurant and bar hosting the likes of K-pop sensations BTS and JY Park and seeing families grow with the restaurant. They come here with their kids, you know, and then their kids come with their girlfriends and wife. It's, it's crazy. So we've been here through a few a couple generations. A remnant of a lost era, Yosai is one of the last prominent Korean restaurants in Chicago's unofficial Koreatown. From 1997 to 2017, the number of Korean businesses on Lawrence dropped from 158 to 50, according to Immigrant Connect Chicago. Yosai's sustained success, patrons say, is in large part to Cho, better known as Cholo. Everyone comes here looking for him. You know, they're always like, hey, where's Cholo, where's Cholo? Because he talks to everybody, just like makes her feel comfortable. Patrons say that Yosai needs to stay in Koreatown because it's an established part of the Korean identity in Chicago. If you talk to like any Korean, it kind of like where you go for a Korean bar, probably this is the first one. It gives the identity of like 
just a Korean bar for this this area. You know? He knows he can't move. The restaurant serving Chicago's Korean community for nearly three decades and hopefully for years to come. In Rogers Park, Lance Wilhelm, Northwestern News Network. Four, three. Coming up, grab your sneakers and see how these Chicagoans exercise and build community through their weekly walks. And all aboard! Take a look at how one Chicago neighborhood is keeping their role in railroad history alive. We'll be right back. My narrative since I've been locked up and kind of made my transition has been like redemption, accountability. When I come into the classroom environment, every individual that sits amongst me takes education seriously. Welcome back. As summer nears, there's no better way to get fresh air than through a walk across the city. NNN's Naya Reyes takes us to Chicago's museum campus to the local walking group getting their steps in and making friends along the way. On Saturday morning, women of all ages from all parts of the city gathered in athletic gear on the north side of the Field Museum. What might look like a special gathering is an average weekend for these Chicago residents. This is my third walk, um, or fourth, fourth walk. Chicago Girls Who Walk meets every week, walking anywhere from one to three miles. The locations vary, but with the summer weather approaching, what better place to walk than Chicago's lakefront? I'm new to the city. I saw like Girls Who Walk on Instagram, and I thought it'd be a really nice way to explore the city and meet new people at the same time. Inspired by the TikTok trend Hot Girl Walks, Chicago resident Michaela Marcinko created Chicago's group in March of 2022. It blows my mind like every day with all the different stuff that happens within this club and all the opportunities that we get and things like that from something that I never thought would have like grown as much as it had. Less than two years after its founding, what started as 20 people is now between 70 to 100 walking together. This is something that everyone's intentional here. Everyone is wanting this shared experience together. So I've met some really lovely people. Participants finding community outside of the weekly walks. It's an opportunity to meet different women, you know, career oriented. Um, some are in school, some are, you know, moms. The group also partners with organizations and companies across the city to create social events for its members. In Chicago's museum campus, walking through the city, Naya Reyes, Northwestern News Network. Thank you, Naya. Walks are free and happen every week. Dates, times, and locations are all posted on their Instagram at Chicago Girls Who Walk. Be sure to visit it to find out more information. Walking across Chicago is certainly great exercise, and with free admission to certain Chicago museums this June, Chicagoans can take their walks while checking out some of the best that the city has to offer. There's free admission at Adler Planetarium on Wednesday nights, the Field Museum on Tuesdays in June, the Art Institute of Chicago on Thursday evenings, and the Chicago History Museum on June 19th and 28th. Moving now to River North, a furry friend can make a great addition to any home. NNN Simone Garber follows how Chicagoland pet rescue initiatives are showing their animals some tender loving care. Though they be but little, they are fierce. At only four weeks old, these kittens are on the move. This is Roberta. Roberta is among a litter of kittens fostered in Kathy Herwig's Edgewater home. Herbig has been fostering with local rescue Friends of Petrits for the past five years. They're all, you know, fostered by 
families and people you know in their homes for the most part so i think that people really get to see the personalities of the pets according to the american society for the prevention of cruelty to animals 23 million american households adopted a pet during the pandemic now shelter animals count says ongoing economic instability has made some people attempt to rehome their pets don't try to rehome you know the pet yourself you should you know contact a rescue or the rescue that you adopted from. Some rescues, like the Anti-Cruelty Society in River North, saw over 4,000 adoptions in 2021. During the pandemic, I feel like our numbers kind of shot upward, um, just because I think a lot of people were looking for a companion and they had like more time. As some adoption numbers fall, many shelters' message for potential adopters rings even clearer. Do your research. You should provide a safe place for them to locate in side of your home so that they can feel safe and um, reassuring that they're okay here. Finding their forever homes. In River North, Simone Garber, Northwestern News Network. I love that adoptions are on the rise. And I know one person who is also getting ready to adopt, Julia Richardson, she's talking about it all the time. She can't wait for her cat. I know so many people who have loved getting pets as graduation gifts, especially when graduating college and moving on with the rest of their lives. Yeah, a graduation gift that keeps on giving. Now, speaking of graduation, it's approaching and parents are coming to campus. It's time to ditch the dining halls. NNN's Vanessa Kelson dishes out some delicious Chicago spots you should have your parents take you to. Two years ago, we showed you some of the best spots in Chicago for grad weekend. I'm Vanessa and this is my roommate Joe. An avid home chef with an affinity for flame, he's graduating and we're on a mission to find Chicago's best to celebrate. Now, she's graduating and we're back for more. First, we headed to Cafecito, a Cuban coffee house right near the Ward Inner Campus stop. We ordered the pitcher of Cafecito, a classic Cuban espresso with a delicious amount of sugar. Cheers! Cheers! So roasty. Next, dinner. dinner! Virtue brings southern food to Chicago's south side. The cornbread is southerner approved. It was perfectly browned and crispy all the way around, but still moist and dense on the inside. For mains, I ordered the morel mushrooms with Egyptian grains and sweet peas. The dish was served lukewarm, and there wasn't as much complexity or depth to the flavor beyond the mushrooms. I ordered the blackened catfish with barbecue carrots. The blackening was deep and warming with a hint of heat. For dessert, we got Virtue's homemade take on banana pudding. The pudding itself tasted like a perfectly ripe, sweet banana. Business Insider calls Chicago the best food city in America. Congrats, grad. Thank you, and eat up. In Hyde Park, Vanessa Kelson, Northwestern News Network. Delicious. Thanks, Vanessa. The intercampus shuttle takes anyone with a wild card into downtown Chicago for free, making it even easier to enjoy the city's offerings. Coming up, showcasing Chicago's history. We introduce you to the historian highlighting the city's south and west sides. And look what you made Chicago businesses do. How locals are preparing for the weekend Swifty Stampede. Don't go away. My narrative since I've been locked up and kind of made my transition has been like redemption, accountability. When I come into the classroom environment, every individual that sits amongst me takes education seriously.
Welcome back. Chicago's population has decreased by 3% since 2020. NNN's Maria Heim talked to current and former city residents to find out why. The reason why I was okay leaving was because I feel Chicago's not what it was when I was growing up. The U.S. Census Bureau releasing estimates last May, revealing Chicago lost about 81,000 residents since 2020. Experts say this decline could be a problem because... And it's very hard to grow economically if you're shrinking in terms of population. But the reason for the decline is not so clear. Some point to remote work and mortality rates during the pandemic. While some of these patterns were started before COVID, um, in a lot of cases they got worse during COVID. Others say it's about the increased cost of living in big cities. Bay Area, I was paying $400 less a month for a place that was about half the size. This population decline can be attributed to four things. Fewer moving to Chicago, more moving out, fertility rates, and mortality rates. From the numbers, we don't know which of these four things are going on, and it's probably a combination of at least two of these things. And beyond the factors driving these decisions, we really need to know more about who's coming and who's going and why. With these shifts, experts also see potential for positive changes. There are opportunities that open up for urban farming, people to just live with more space, unhoused and unsheltered people. Shifts encompassing Chicago's changing landscape. Maria Heim, Northwestern News Network. Now, as Maria laid out, the task for Chicago is to address some of those root causes in a way that builds sustainable economic growth and stops further population loss. Thanks, Maria. Chicago's South Side is filled with history not usually highlighted by the city's tourism. And then Sabrina Carson shares how one Chicagoan looks to share South Side stories through bus tours. I shouldn't be the only dude bringing, bringing people by the block that King lived on here in Chicago. Lifelong Chicagoan Sherman Dilla Thomas educates tourists and city residents on Chicago's South and West Sides through his company, Chicago Mahogany Tours. By the end of it, I hope you agree with me that everything dope about America comes from Chicago. While some Chicago bus tours focus mostly on tourist attractions found in the loop, Dilla's tours focus more on the South Side, talking about the community and vibrant history of Chicago. We're going to learn about restrictive racial covenants. We're going to learn about contract buying. We're going to learn about redlining. And Thomas's tours are not afraid to discuss Chicago's complicated past. My tours act as a historical context to what we're seeing today, good, bad, or ugly. Thomas runs a TikTok account promoting these stories, establishing a virtual community of over 100,000 loyal followers. During these tours, Thomas shares his historic knowledge on buildings like the old Central Park Theater, Dr. King's Chicago residence, and the original Sears Tower. I've been on the south side of Chicago all my life and didn't know that much history was there. A passionate historian who truly loves his calling. I can't believe that I get to spend my time pointing out stuff that I love in my city, so it's, it's, it's really fulfilling. Sabrina is with us in the studio now. Sabrina, can you tell us a little bit more about why this community is so important to Thomas? Hello, Gabrielle. So as I had said before, pre previously, um, Thomas is a born Chicagoan and his TikTok account promotes his South and West Side community and Chicago history. But something that I found very interesting is during the tour, people would pass by in cars or even in a bus. And this happened at least three times. And they would say, go Dilla or keep doing what you're doing. Let's actually see something like that. So as you can see in that clip, it truly shows Thomas's dedication to not only his work of preserving history, but also how he takes part in the community as well. Thanks so much, Sabrina. To learn more about these tours, go to www.chicagomahogany.com. On Chicago's far south side, George Pullman's rail car factory has been preserved as Chicago's only national historical park. Earlier this month, the Historical Pullman Foundation hosted a must-do event for railroad enthusiasts. NNN's Logan Skijano took a ride down and has more. 
All aboard for the second annual Pullman Railroad Days. The weekend's long event at Pullman National Historical Park offered a taste of everything for rail fans and Southside residents. I feel like it's good to know about the good things that came out of being in this area. What was once America's model industrial town, Pullman is known for its role in railroad innovation. One of the things I hope visitors see is that they have an amazing gym here on the far south side of Chicago. The event featuring classic train tunes, an engineer simulator, and tours of old cars, all so that people could understand the role of railroads in our economy, both past and present. Watch your step, please. There are three railroad cars here on display throughout the weekend, including this 1949 Pullman sleeper car, which hosted the likes of Elvis Presley and Richard Nixon on their journeys throughout the country. It feels like doing something completely new once you're walking into each one, seeing how they differ into it, what's what's so absolutely beautiful about them. Hello guys, welcome aboard. Andre Barry is the attendant of this car, which is still 98% original. What he enjoys most about sharing its history with others? The smiles, it's always the smiles. And smiles were off the rails at the event, especially for those who made it happen. I'm a lifelong Southsider and I want to be able to play a part in making the South Side enjoyable. In Pullman, Logan Skijano, Northwestern News Network. Thanks, Logan. The Parks Visitor Center is open throughout the year, and guided walking tours are offered on the first Sunday of every month, including this Sunday. It's now time for Under the Microscope, and it is a great day because NNN's Jenny Ha is here. She literally stepped off the plane under two hours ago, but yet she's still here with the latest Chicago science news. Jenny, what are you looking at under the microscope? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's great to be back. For Under the Microscope this week, we bring you the latest health and science updates from across Chicago. First, the Chicago Department of Public Health announcing a potential resurgence of MPOX, formerly known as monkeypox. This comes despite the World Health Organization declaring the end to the MPOX public health emergency. Over the past month, 69% of Chicago's reported cases were in fully vaccinated men. Now, doctors are also encouraging Chicagoans to practice safe sex. Also making waves, oceanography organization Mission Blue designates the Great Lakes as, quote, hope spot. This comes after Shedd Aquarium's push for recognition of the region. Mission Blue's hope spot designation highlights, highlights bodies of water critical to the health of the ocean, like the Great Barrier Reef and the Galapagos I excuse me, islands. The organization describes the lakes as the, quote, heart of the North American water system, highlighting their unique biodiversity. Thanks so much, Jenny, for covering those science stories for us. And we're so happy to have you back, even if it's just for a little bit right at the end of the year. I'm Je happy to back, too. Jenny, what's the one thing you want to do in Evanston this week? That's a great question. Well, the weather is very warm. It was actually very cold in Korea where I was vacationing. So just picnicking on the lake, though. There we go. And, and, no, <laughs> and no finals to do it. No but, finals. Yeah, there we go. Well, so coming up, it's a new era for Taylor Swift. She's breaking records at Soldier Field, and NNN's Max Rothbetter is here to fearlessly break down all of it on the big board when we return. My narrative since I've been locked up and kind of made my transition has been like redemption, accountability. When I come into the classroom environment, every individual that sits amongst me takes education seriously.
We are just three days away from Taylor Swift taking the stage at Soldier Field. Don't blame me if I'm counting down the days, but Andrew, you found out that tourism officials are too? Yeah, that's right. Her visit filling Soldier Stadium is shaping up to a, be a boom for the city of Chicago. And as businesses are creating experience to make, for Swifties in particular, they're making sparks fly. Taylor Swift's Eras Tour has a reputation. tourism. Anything and everything Taylor related around the weekend of your show is just you want to get it all in. And businesses are taking advantage. We're like a Taylor Swift obsessed archery range. Wanderlust Archers in Palatine is hosting Swift themed nights. Yes, those are some of her exes on the targets. We do weddings every weekend, but it's really, really exciting to be able to do something a little bit different. Tamara Makeup and Hair Artistry is used to glamming up brides. We have booked out for all three days of the concert. But this weekend, the salon will be full of Swifties. We have all the jewels and the gems and the snakes and everything. We have it all set to go. And baker Caroline Roth is selling handcrafted cookie sets. I did a one pre-sale last week. Yep. And that sold out in four minutes. I love Taylor Swift and my customers love her too. And so do Chicago tourism officials. It looks like all of our hotels are going to be pretty close to full. Tourism in Chicago last year was 80% of 2019 levels. Concerts this year will play a big role in growing that number. It's not just Taylor Swift. It's Beyonce, it's Bruce Springsteen, Ed Sheeran, Madonna, Guns N' Roses. We've got a full schedule this summer. The city says a key component of success to the weekend is getting Swifties out of their hotel when the concert's not going on and into restaurants. People will definitely, hopefully, flock here. All Too Well Deli in Lincoln Park will offer a sandwich called Taylor's Version. We found out she loves turkey sandwiches and she loves hummus. The deli is also offering discounts when you show your concert ticket. Even though her concert's like four hours long or whatever, it's not even enough. When the concert is over, tourism officials hope this weekend will be a love story for the city's economy. Thanks, Andrew. I will certainly be one of those Swifties ready to shake it off this weekend. It's going to be an amazing show, one that's breaking records. Yeah, it is. So let's get over to NNN's Max Rothbetter at the big board. He knows what records are being broken all too well by Swift this weekend. Max? Yeah, that's right. She's going to be breaking quite a few records because she is proving that she is the man with her heiress tour. This show spans an enchanted three hours and makes history in the process. So let's look back through it. She first played Soldier Field back in August of 2013 on her Red Tour just for one night. Then she came back in 2015 for the 1989 World Tour, setting the record for a female artist by playing two nights, which she did again in 2018 for the Reputation Stadium Tour. Now, Soldier Field has played with some of the biggest artists in music, from Madonna to John Bon Jovi to Bruce Springsteen to, of course, Taylor Swift. But the record, that goes to U2, who set it in 1997 on their Pop Mart World Tour when they played three consecutive nights. But with her performances this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, Taylor is set to become the first female artist to sell out three nights at Soldier Field. Quite an accomplishment that's going to be. Now, what can you expect if you're going? Well, based on our previous shows, attendance is expected to be at 50,000 a night. That means 150,000 plus for the weekend. With that many people, experts recommend that you arrive early. Doors open at 4.30. There's gonna be long security lines, long merchandise lines, and then have a transportation plan ready. Getting into and out of Soldier Field can be tough, so make a plan ahead of time. So what can you expect? Well, she's gonna play nine of her 10 eras. The set list has 44 songs on it, and spans three hours and 15 minutes. But one of the best parts of the show is her acoustic set, when she plays two songs, one on guitar, one on piano, and they're a surprise. Could be from any era, any album, and if she messes it up, she could play it again. So Gabrielle, I know you're excited. Andrew, I know you're excited too. Um, but Gabrielle, you're going. What songs do you hope she's gonna play? Oh my god, it's so hard to ask me that. I know for me, I'm really hoping she plays a debut song as one of the surprise songs, just because I don't understand how you can do an Eras tour and not play something from your first album. Yeah, no, it's so interesting. All the non-Swifties were like, okay, the concert's coming. Now that we've hit this week, everyone's like, can I get, still get tickets? I want to go. Like, they want to be part of this energy. Yeah, I mean, I was able to, I got really lucky. I stayed in the queue for like six hours. I skipped the class, but I did manage to get my tickets from the original sale. Um, maybe I shouldn't be saying that on air. Hopefully my professor's not watching, but I did skip a class to get those tickets. It'll all be worth it after the concert.
All right, well, that's all the time we have for tonight. But before we say goodnight for the school year, the entire NNN team wants to say thank you to Andrew and all the graduating seniors. We've all been so lucky to learn from you and work with you. We're going to miss you so much. But we'll be rooting for you as you move on to the next chapter of your lives. I know NNN would not have been the same without all of you. Thank you, Gabby. And I want to note the prompter says maybe say something <laughs> nice. Uh, so <laughs> NNN has been a great place to experiment and also is one of the places where I've met my closest friends and just love that Tuesday night chaos. So it's, I'm gonna miss all of you, but you're gonna do great work next year. And on that note, thank you for watching our special Chicago show. I'm Gabrielle Coriati. And I'm Andrew Rowan. Have a good